good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's uh, indeed interesting times uh, with COVID-19 uh, implications on uh, our work uh, throughout the world, uh, in Europe and in uh, the operational realities when we have the cluster. So I'm very grateful for all the colleagues that are joining us, uh, especially uh, in uh, field operations. Uh, today is uh, is quite an exciting uh, moment, uh, as uh, since I joined the Global Protection Cluster about six months ago, we have started a series of uh, online webinars to uh, to engage uh, with field colleagues, uh, share some of the thoughts uh, we're seeing and observing in some operations, bring it to to a global uh, cross country conversation. Uh, we have had several uh, so far. Um, on uh, peace development uh, nexus, on uh, role of protection and response, and uh, role of protection in counterterrorism environments. Uh, but uh, since I started the work, uh, I started almost at the same time with Valerie, uh, our colleague uh, in UNHCR, who's heading the human rights section there. And since day one, uh, Valerie uh, brought her uh, her hat as a previous uh, cluster coordinator uh, and uh, current hat as a head of a human rights uh, team, uh, and said, uh, we really, William, need to strengthen uh, two things uh, in field operations. One, uh, how uh, the cluster uh, are benefiting and using uh, human rights uh, mechanism, and two, the understanding of uh, cluster members on the role of the cluster when it comes to, to human rights. So it took us a while uh, to conceive uh, together this uh, first moment uh, of conversation. It comes also at the same time where we are restructuring uh, the work at global level, and we have approved uh, recently uh, the establishment of a task team uh, on a human rights under the global protection cluster, where indeed we will uh, take some of the thoughts uh, that we will put together uh, here today uh, to fruition and implementation. Uh, so by way of introduction, uh, let me offer uh, uh, two main uh, thoughts. Uh, first, uh, of course, the anchorage of protection in human rights is something uh, established. Uh, and this is something that uh, we'd like to strengthen. Sometimes we uh, we see that uh, protection response and protection analysis have been siloed in few uh, uh, elements of the human rights, but uh, somehow ignore the wider human rights responsibilities. And this is an area where we would like to, uh, to re-broaden uh, protection, take it to the general level of, uh, of its human rights understanding, international humanitarian uh, law in broad terms. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's the first element. The second element is that uh, as protection cluster members and protection clusters and operations, we have a responsibility to contribute uh, to human rights mechanism. Uh, while we also have the responsibility to maintain humanitarian access uh, to our operations. And sometimes uh, these two uh, come together and reinforce in each other. Sometimes there is a perception uh, that these two uh, go against each other. Uh, and one of the key uh, issues that we'd like to discuss today, but also take forward in the task teams, is to clarify how the members of the protection cluster can utilize existing human rights mechanisms. So there is a can, how can they do that? But there's also the obligation. Where, are, where do we have the actual responsibility? And it's not an option if we should or not use and contribute to uh, information regarding human rights in the country and analysis around. Uh, so uh, with these uh, two questions, I would like to uh, 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 open uh, uh, the discussion, hand over to uh, Valerie, who will uh, brief us on the engagement with the human rights mechanisms 
uh, brief us, give us an overview of the existing mechanisms, and zoom in with uh, field experience on the possibilities of engagement. Then we will have about uh, 20 to 25 minutes of questions and answers, uh, and then uh, uh, maybe try to wrap up with some concrete next steps uh, going forward. So, with big thanks uh, to uh, to the operation cell of the Global Protection Cluster for organizing this, and uh, for the Human Rights uh, Liaison Unit in UNHCR, I'm very glad to hand over back to you, Peter, uh, and onwards to Valerie. Over. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you so much, Valerie. Uh, we have a good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, as uh, William was saying, this is really a pleasure to, to have this webinar because we have been bring, brainstorming for months with William how to best uh, bring the human rights engagement to, the, to clusters, protection clusters, and how we can actually take advantage of the systems without necessarily overburdening or putting additional work uh, for cluster coordinators and cluster members. And, um, I hope this is the first of various discussions we could have eventually in the future and see how uh, is the Human Rights Liaison Unit and eventually beyond that we could uh, support you uh, within the different possibilities of human rights engagement. Maybe just to have an idea who is online, would it be possible that uh, uh, you would send to, to, to the chat box uh, just from which operation uh, you are now connecting, so in which operation you work, in which protection cluster, and if you have been already engaged with the human rights mechanisms uh, in the role of protection cluster coordinator or member. Uh, would it be possible so that we know a little bit more about each other, please? So, if you can just say in which operation you are working and if you have already experienced with uh, engagement uh, with the human rights mechanism as part of the cluster system. That would be very useful. Uh, so we see that we have from Syria, uh, excellent, uh, welcome Mohamed. Um, from Khalid of IRC. From Khartoum, excellent, uh, welcome Aziz. Uh, Sarah, hi Sarah, uh, hello to chat. Kamba from Central African Republic, excellent. So we have a big variety of operations, South Sudan, Nigeria, Sudan, um, very good. Excellent. It's good to hear the diversity of operations and actually the human rights mechanisms are really relevant to all operations where protection clusters are activated. So uh, you will see that uh, maybe you don't need to engage with all of them at all times, but you can pick and choose and strategically see when it is uh, interesting for you and strategically good to engage uh, with the different mechanisms. And I see we have also colleagues from Guatemala, from Niger, and that's excellent. So, very good. So, let us uh, get us started. Um, I have asked uh, if uh, some of you have already been engaged with human rights mechanisms. I don't see any answers. People are shy. Don't be shy because uh, we know and we have discussed that with uh, uh, William several times. This has been somehow a blind spot for us uh, uh, how we can engage strategically with the human rights mechanism and then how we can bring the cluster protection clusters to use the mechanisms more when it's useful and uh, needed. I have gone through the protection cluster strategies that are online on the GPC website. And just briefly to see uh, the strategic objectives and uh, where the different operations are. And it's interesting to see that basically for all protection clusters, human rights are either in the strategic objectives or in the priorities um, that are mentioned and outlined. So it's something which we 
see very important probably or highly on our agenda, but what it is beyond those fluffy words of human rights and uh, we must protect and uh, respect human rights, what it means for us pr uh, practically as uh, protection cluster coordinators and members and how we can use the different tools uh, throughout our work. So this is the question we will try to unpack a little bit uh, today in this, in this webinar. Uh, you might have seen also recently, actually two weeks ago, the Secretary General has uh, launched a new document, a very important document, which is called a call to action on human rights, the highest aspiration. And William mentioned just in the introduction that it is not only an option in some cases when uh, we should engage with human rights mechanisms, but we have also obligations. We have also obligations how we should engage at minimum. Most of you are familiar with the initiative Human Rights Upfront. So what is our role in mainly conflict situations and what are the red lines for us? What are the uh, minimum requirements that uh, we should be um, looking into. So just uh, drawing our attention that some uh, areas uh, should become a part of our work and uh, mainstream it into the existing system. I think we have some colleagues online. Okay, we are muted. If you have questions or any comments during uh, the webinar, you can of course uh, uh, write to the chat box or uh, raise a hand and uh, ask at any moment. So um, maybe next slide, Peter, if I can ask you please to move on. How we can engage with the human rights mechanisms. And here I would like to stress, and as William said, the idea is not to give you any additional work or yet another reporting template or uh, something that would be an additional responsibility and deadlines for you. No. So I, I want to clear that from the beginning, clarify this is about providing you with additional existing mechanisms and channels for your work that you might not have known before or that you might not have explored fully before and uh, this is to make your work easier, uh, not to make it more cumbersome. And as we will see at some point you may decide that uh, engagement is not the uh, way forward for you, that it is not the, um, the time or uh, that the conditions are not met for you, it's okay, but you know that you have the options to engage uh, with different mechanisms and each of them has different advantages, possibilities and constraints, so you can mix them also as uh, it is useful for your context. So this engagement will be very context specific and depends on your country operation. Um, and I already mentioned that we have also uh, human rights uh, mentioned many times in uh, protection cluster strategies, which is excellent. It's a starting point. But if we have a look at the uh, HCT protection strategies, when actually protection cluster is advising and the HCT members and the HC on some critical uh, protection analysis and priorities uh, uh, areas to focus on. There are actually very little elements and references to human rights and obligations that come with it as well. So uh, we also realized that in this area as advisors to, to the HCTs, uh, the production cluster would need to bring that element into the work and analysis to make sure that we provide a full picture uh, of the analysis, not just from the needs perspective, but also from the uh, human rights based approach. And this is something that we have heard from various field operations. What is the difference between needs-based approach, human rights-based approach, how it is relevant for us, why we need to make this distinction. 
So this is also something that we try to work on with the global protection cluster. We have put together an initial note that maybe we can share with you later or have another webinar later if needed and useful to go more in depth and explain the difference, but also to draw the attention that those discussions are in many operations very relevant. Uh, many of you who are online, we have worked already together in, in the past, so you know that I come from the cluster coordinator's perspective and when joining this new position in the Human Rights Liaison Unit, I actually realized in how many situations I could have used the mechanisms more strategically and I could have approached them and I could have used them in areas or situations where I had, I thought that there is no more option for advocacy, for reaching out to the government, for uh, being in situations where I felt uh, my hands are tight. Uh, so uh, now looking from this side, I would like to show you some concrete examples where I think the engagement can be useful for you and in which way uh, you can use it. For example, when you don't have access to some parts of territory but you need information or when the government is not very forthcoming on some questions or when you would like to follow up on some commitments uh, from different ministries and so on. So we will go into those examples a little bit more in detail as we progress with the presentation. I also, uh, you see on the screen that I mentioned dialogue on sensitive issues and this is something which I see as a big added value of the human rights mechanism. So um, as an example, we, what we do currently, for example, when we are aware of a very delicate situation and uh, uh, we know that uh, there are human rights violations happening, but we know that we cannot raise it directly with the government because it would compromise our position or our, our situation on the ground. It may further restrict our access or it may uh, really harm some uh, relationship that we have been already building for a long time. So we use, for example, some special reporter, independent experts, to pass the information to then approach the government from their side, but this is all in confidential manner. So nobody actually knows that uh, behind it's, uh, it's us or as UNHCR, but uh, the information is being channeled uh, by entities which are highly respected by the governments, which are independent and uh, uh, which are seen as a credible uh, source of information. So we can reach the means without necessarily exposing other parts of our, uh, our um, uh, strategies if it would have an impact. This is context specific, but just to give you an example. Uh, I believe that engaging with the human rights mechanisms would also create uh, some new synergies in their respective country operations and clusters with actors with whom we don't necessarily engage with traditionally. So, for example, national human rights institutions in some operations uh, such as Guatemala, uh, Latin America, I'm sure you are already very much in touch with, but in others less. Do we use their potential as uh, independent entities, but having big access to parliamentarians, to, uh, to civil society from different angles. So this is just a type of um, uh, stakeholders that we may benefit from including in our stakeholders analysis and looking into possible synergies when working on human rights engagement. Another um, area um, where I believe the human rights engagement would be really beneficial is, as we will see, there are different platforms which discuss the uh, human rights uh, violations and situation of human rights across all countries in the world, meaning all operations where protection clusters are activated. And um, as a result, uh, if we bring in the angle of 
displaced persons. We will uh, hopefully also get the commitment of countries to progress on some situations. Just for your information, we have done recently an analysis of the recommendations that were made in, uh, in the Universal Periodic Review. I will get a bit later on what it means exactly. But there are a lot of comments and recommendations related to refugee, to stateless persons, to asylum seekers, but very little on internal displaced persons. So we hope that this is part of the initiative to boost a bit uh, this aspect and bring different actors, mainly protection clusters, to, to be more present uh, and using those mechanisms. Um, a very important element as well is that through the human rights engagement, there is an aspect of uh, um, sharing information with internal displaced persons about their human rights, human rights education. So how do we actually channel and, uh, and make available the information about the rights of IDPs to themselves? Because if they are not aware, it's difficult that they use it proactively and uh, also the fact that it comes with certain responsibilities. So we worked uh, with other uh, agencies such as OHCHR, UNICEF, UNFPA, UN Women on aspects related to human rights education and uh, we hope that this will be an area that we will further develop and maybe even uh, pilot some of the initiatives with you in the field. And therefore empower IDPs in claiming their rights and being aware of, of their rights. And lastly, the point that I had on the first slide is uh, uh, to make the connections with 2030 agenda and with the broader initiatives that are currently ongoing and on which, to which many of operations in which you work are contributing. So uh, in various operations, I think mainly, uh, basically all that you mentioned before in which you work, the governments have an action plan related to 2030 agenda. And um, I don't know how much you, in given con uh, specific context, you contribute to those action plans or how much you participate in the discussions, but it is also an area where protection of IDPs could be strengthened. So and the question of refugees is quite uh, now well represented, uh, other sectors, but Protection of IDPs seem to be um, a bit uh, left behind. So we hope that this would, again, uh, not only raise the awareness, but also strengthen some partnerships with uh, non-traditional counterparts that are also working on similar initiatives. So this is just uh, to frame a bit our discussion. And do you have any question at this point? You can uh, unmute yourself or uh, raise a question through the chat box. No questions so far? Okay, very good. Um, everybody hears me okay? No complaints? Peter? Loud and clear. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, Liam. So with that, uh, I would like to move to, to an overview of the mechanisms. Peter, please. Next slide. Very good. So there are four main uh, mechanisms that I would like to mention briefly. Human Rights Council, Universal Periodic Review, Special Procedures and Treaty Bodies. And let me make one uh, point. When we say human rights, many people immediately make a connection. Oh, yes, OHCHR. We have a colleague, OHCHR, that's for OHCHR. No. Uh, so if we speak about human rights, it's a responsibility of every single agency and organization. It's like the centrality of protection in humanitarian action. We cannot say it's just protection cluster. I think we are the ones who understand that very well. It's a responsibility of everybody. So uh, all of us, we have a 
responsibilities and commitments that we need to follow up on. And OHCHR is supporting, of course, is the agency focusing on uh, human rights, but also supporting as a secretariat many of the mechanisms. But it doesn't mean and that it lies with them uh, for implementation. We all share the burden and the responsibility between us. So briefly, um, uh, on the different mechanisms, so uh, they have been initiated by the General Assembly, which created a Human Rights Council. And under the Human Rights Council, we have two important human rights mechanisms, universal periodic review and special procedures. I will now go more in depth into explaining what, what they mean. General Assembly also adopted actually 10 main human rights uh, treaties, and uh, we will hear more about them as well. And each of the treaties, to simplify, has an associated uh, treaty body or a committee that is then following on the implementation. And we will see how we can also engage with them and how it can be useful for protection clusters. So if we can move on, Peter, we will start uh, with uh, the Human Rights Council. So the Human Rights Council is happening in Geneva, but I still felt it's important that we mention how it works so that you see the bigger picture and how it all fits together. So the Human Rights Council uh, is an intergovernmental body, meaning that 193 states that are members of the United Nations system are uh, meeting regularly, actually three times a year, in March, in June, and in September, to discuss the situation of human rights across the world. Uh, okay? So, there are some themes that are regularly discussed, as well as emerging situations. And this is a platform which brings together all governments and also civil society, UN agencies. It's a big, um, big event. And uh, we can take advantage about, uh, from this mechanism in various ways. Um, if we can move to the next slide, Peter, please. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, happening at Geneva level, but I just wanted to give you an example how we can feed into interacting with the Human Rights Council session. So to give you an example, the Human Rights Council session uh, has been just happening the last few weeks, and they discuss situations in Yemen, in DRC Congo, in Libya, in Burundi, in Nicaragua. So I think all of those situations are very, very relevant to protection clusters, of course. Uh, Sahel was very high on the agenda. And you have the heads of state or the prime ministers, members of the parliament, uh, civil society, discussing, presenting on the situation, but also uh, receiving suggestions from other states, from civil society, from UN agencies, on uh, what is the situation and what uh, should be done going forward or should not be done, of course. So we have an opportunity when there are those discussions to provide oral statements. Those are short oral statements uh, that last about two minutes, but why is it important is to draw attention to some issues or topics that are not necessarily uh, highlighted in the discussion. So I give you a very concrete example. For Libya, uh, all the discussions around Libya are usually around migrants and asylum seekers, onward movement, but there is very, very little being discussed on internal displaced persons in Libya. So, in that regard, for example, the production cluster could channel the information and draw the attention of the community to the fact that they are also internally displaced persons who have specific protection needs who have, um, you know, additional challenges and where there are gaps in the system uh, to address them. Just as an example, okay, I'm uh, coming up now. So this is not necessarily uh, a negative oral statement. It cannot draw in a positive way attention uh, to some issue, but it can also comment uh, some positive development uh, in a country. So for example, 
thinking about Niger, as we have colleagues from Niger, when uh, there was the IDP law passed uh, uh, in Niger, we can commend the government of Niger for taking those positive steps and encourage them further to engage on uh, the topics related to IDPs and providing technical support whenever needed, and uh, etc. So this is an example how we can engage an oral statement. We can also, of course, there are many side events during the Human Rights Council session. We can not only participate uh, because they are very interested, but also organize side events. Here, as it is uh, happening in Geneva, uh, it, I mean, this would be further for discussion with William and the GPC, but they may, there might be an opportunity, for example, to do a side event on uh, the connect, uh, the intersection between climate change and conflict-induced displacement uh, in internal displacement context, or uh, looking into production challenges in emerging situations in Sahel. I mean, any topic you can think of, but this brings together the different stakeholders and, of course, brings a lot of attention to a topic because there are many people attending. So we can also host side events. And if you think uh, this may be an opportunity for you, a situation that you would like to raise, please uh, reach out to William and the GPC and we can connect how to best support. Uh, it's also a platform uh, where we can collaborate with other UN agencies, civil society permanent missions, so for you to know that uh, the Human Rights Liaison Unit connects with a lot of permanent missions and we share with them information on confidential and non-confidential basis. So we have regular exchanges with them and we share with them, for example, some worrying trends or some, we highlight some, some recommendations that would be good that they follow up with other countries. So it's also a means how to uh, at different levels influence and draw the attention to specific issues. So this is also a channel that we have not yet explored for internal displacement, but we use very actively for refugees and stateless persons. Uh, during the Human Rights Council session, there are also resolutions that are being drafted. Again, uh, just in the last few weeks, we had a resolution on trafficking, on persons with disabilities, racial discrimination on uh, 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 child abuse. Uh, so all those topics, of course, that you are working on in the field, uh, we could look into how to best input the internal displacement aspects to the work. And of course, uh, we, can, we have also the opportunity whenever there is a presentation of the situation to channel relevant information because the protection clusters have very effective means of protection monitoring, collecting information, analyzing trends. So this information from the ground is very useful uh, for, for those discussions. Very good. And uh, please, if uh, we can move on, Peter. As we saw on the graph, one of the, one part of the Human Rights Council is the universal periodic review. The, so a second human rights mechanism that I will present to you now. And what is a universal periodic review? Uh, we often say UPR. The UPR is a very interesting mechanism because every single country in the world, so 193 uh, UN member states, is being reviewed on the situation of the human rights every four years. So every four years, we look in detail into a situation in a country and see how uh, the human rights are being respected or not. And this is without exception. And this is, we are now in a third cycle of this uh, UPR. So it means that every country is now being reviewed for the third time. So it's not that every, each country is reviewed uh, at the same time, but every year we have uh, over 40 countries that are being reviewed. And what it means that they are being reviewed? The state which is being reviewed prepares a report from their perspective. 
but then we have a compilation of reports from UN agencies. And we have also reports from civil society, including NGOs, national human rights institutions, and so on. So there are three elements. And this is what is then being reviewed because those reports are public, okay? So they, you can find them online. They are uh, being shared publicly. Now, so far, uh, how it works is that when, let's say, uh, Sudan is under review from UNHCR side, we contact UNHCR colleagues in Sudan and we work with them on preparing a report on Sudan, but we don't see uh, actually many operations where protection cluster coordinators would be involved in this process and when they would uh, provide input. If uh, this is not to be associated with UNHCR, protection cluster can prepare a report under the civil society, okay? So it depends, of course, on the dynamics. Either we can feed the report uh, inputs uh, uh, to the UN compilation, or uh, we can, of course, use the other channels through civil society. But it would be interesting to look into the possibilities of consulting with cluster members and providing inputs or submitting a report uh, on situation of internally displaced persons. And this is where I mentioned earlier that we have done an analysis. There is very little being provided on IDPs. There is a lot, a lot on refugees and stateless persons, but we would like to see more prominently IDPs because uh, this is an area which is rarely highlighted uh, as a concern during the, uh, during the process. So what happens actually, those reports are being produced and uh, then the state receives recommendations, okay? About 200 recommendations every time during the cycle. And if the state actually accepts, so if the state supports the recommendation that they receive, then they need to implement it. Okay, this is very important, why? Because they need to report what they have done to achieve uh, this recommendation. So it's really an opening, and this is again an area where the protection clusters, I think, can really use this in the field. Let's say that the government uh, accepts a recommendation or supports a recommendation that they will uh, have uh, a law on IDPs, okay? So then you can approach uh, the government, okay, so the government has um, has supported this recommendation and we are here ready to support you as needed, as useful, to work with you on, on this aspect. Or for example, the government receives a recommendation that all um, security forces should be trained on trafficking in person or on the best interest of the child. Very good. So here you have an opening because you can then work with your counterparts at country level and say we are ready to support you and to work with you. And this is uh, from what we have seen uh, as an experience from operations. This is really highly appreciated uh, because the government needs to show progress and uh, uh, in many uh, situations they don't have the capacity you know, to do so or the technical expertise. So then uh, they very much welcome any, any support coming from, uh, from you, from protection clusters or agencies. Uh, maybe I should also mention that there are special funds available for implementation of those recommendations uh, that are administered by OHCHR. So it's also a possibility to get funding for the implementation that you can support, but uh, maybe this would be a topic for another webinar or further discussion. Very good. So can we move on, Peter, please? So, um, okay, I think I already mentioned all those aspects, how to engage with UPR. Mm -hmm. uh, so, very good. Uh, we can move on, please, Peter. Now we come to the Probably third. Flag a couple questions that came up. Yeah. Um, oh, very good. 
We had one question about uh, confederal states and states that don't fully engage with human rights conventions, whether we have advice on that. And then another question from a legal perspective, whether the information provided by us uh, is credible from their perspective, talking about the Human Rights Council. Um, so the first one is on the uh, treaty bodies, the committees, the convention? Uh, yes, it can relate to the treaty bodies, uh, but I, I take it more broadly perhaps to, to states that don't fully engage um, okay. themselves. Okay, so I will maybe leave it until we finish the presentation of the four um, treaty, um, human rights mechanisms. Sorry, and the second question? Um, whether from a legal perspective you think that the information that we provide uh, is seen as credible uh, with respect to the Human Rights Council. If it's too politicized or uh, if maybe the person who provided the question can explain a bit more. Colleagues? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's in the chat box, with Mohammed. thanks for the questions. Uh, more generally, I think, um, just from a, whether our information provided to this process is, is credible. If it's credible. The process, I, yeah. Okay, I think I can address how it is perceived. And uh, uh, we are actually keeping track of uh, the recommendations we made and how they are then reflected or being followed. And we are currently at some 60-70% of reflection rate. What it means that the recommendations we make are really uh, highly relevant and actually taken up then by the states for implementation. Uh, so this is a rate which is very high and, uh, and the efforts which go into it are not uh, definitely in vain. Uh, we can share more details per topic also with you if you would be more interested. What are the topics where governments hear more uh, to our recommendations or less? On the political or non-political, of course, uh, this is a dialogue. Uh, the Human Rights Council is a dialogue with intergovernment body. So uh, you may uh, raise a question, is this too politicized? We are working in a politicized environment in every operation we, we are in. Uh, there are politics involved uh, in every uh, activity we do, of course. But as humanitarians, we need to be neutral and follow the humanitarian principles. So the interventions we do are not targeting any kind of political side or mm, any kind of statements that uh, would be taken uh, on either side. We are really drawing attention of the different stakeholders to the needs, to the rights of internally displaced persons, hopefully in that case. And uh, what are the particular protection challenges and what needs to be done more or differently? So we are depoliticizing uh, the, in uh, any way uh, uh, the discourse and bringing attention to uh, to the critical needs. If that responds to to your question, okay. If not, please uh, unmute yourself, dear colleague, and we can provide more clarification. Okay, very good. So at the meantime, maybe we can continue with the special procedures mandate holders. So the third uh, human rights mechanism I would like to present to you. We will share with you a video, summary video also after the webinar where you can see in three minutes what are those uh, mandate holders about. But the, what is um, what do we mean by special procedures mandate holders? Those are either special rapporteur, independent experts, working groups, it doesn't matter what the name is, but those are independent uh, experts which are working on specific theme or topic. At this moment, we have 44 themes or mandates, and currently we engage very actively with about 20 of them. So we don't engage with 
all 44, but uh, the ones that are probably most relevant again to protection clusters are on disability, working group on dis uh, enforced disappearances, on IDPs of course, on older persons, special reporter on children, on trafficking, violence against women and girls. So uh, those mandates are working on topics that uh, you deal with every day. We have also 10 mandates that are related to specific countries and I will park them there because they are uh, relevant to uh, specific operations. We have today Central African Republic and others and uh, the way we engage with them are quite similar. So those independent experts, special procedures mandate holders or special reporters, they are following a specific situation or a theme and they, you can bring to their attention information or ask them to, for example, issue a media statement to, uh, to draw attention to, uh, to a problem or a topic and uh, also eventually invite them for a country visit. So what do they do? They can uh, visit a specific operation and I think just recently the special reporter on IDPs went to Iraq, correct, correct William? You went there uh, as well. So they can visit a country which draws the attention uh, not only of the government and relevant entities, media, but it can open up a dialogue on specific issues that were maybe stuck or blocked and uh, uh, which can help you then uh, in your day-to-day -day activities uh, in the field. So we can proactively actually suggest countries and operations where we feel the independent experts or special reporters should go and visit. This is something we start to do now and we proactively try to suggest uh, in relation to different topics where it might be relevant to, uh, to visit if feasible, if the government consents. Uh, another area where we can engage is uh, in terms of input to annual reports. So those special procedures mandate holders issue two reports a year. One which is presented to the Human Rights Council and the second one to the General Assembly. And there are two aspects. One, we can also have a dialogue uh, with the special procedures mandate holders about the topics to raise to their attention. So for example, we could uh, suggest uh, for the special reporter working on uh, uh, violence against women if she would be interested to look more closely into the situation of IDP women and girls if that is a topic which has not yet been highlighted enough for example and if uh, they are already writing a report they can, we can also provide input so when uh, they are covering a topic we can bring to their attention some data analysis specific protection issues of IDPs in a given context. So all this information can then feed to a report which is presented either to the Human Rights Council or the General Assembly. What is also a very effective way, Peter, if we can pass actually to the next slide, please, is uh, that we can work with them on uh, media statements, press releases, and this can be either in confidential or non-confidential manner. So we can either pair with them and work on, um, on uh, releasing uh, information that uh, we want to draw attention to, but we can also share with them information which is too sensitive and then they release it on uh, of course independently by themselves without necessarily exposing the protection cluster and protection cluster members. It's also an opportunity when they come to a country visit to for example pass them some questions or areas uh, in terms of territory we cannot access but we want to have information on because they can ask, they can go and for us, it's an opportunity to, uh, to get information and uh, not only information, but also maybe to tackle some issues with, uh, where there might be blocks with the government from, from their side. So 
those are just some ideas, but actually the different engagement with the special procedures mandate holders can be very wide and very, uh, uh, the spectrum is very broad and it depends on your country or uh, protection cluster, what, what the gaps are, what the challenges are, what are the uh, protection issues where you seem uh, to be blocked or maybe would like to have more support. Usually, we tend to only engage with the special reporter on IDPs, which is our natural counterpart, of course, Cecilia Jimenez, and it's a very uh, excellent collaboration with many of the protection clusters. But there are, as I mentioned, 44 of those mandates, and we are not fully using them uh, for the IDPs uh, advocacy and situation. So, something to, to explore further. Very good. And uh, I'm looking if there are any questions. Not, not really. So we go to the fourth, uh, fourth uh, uh, human rights mechanism, which is the treaty bodies. I will take a little break and pass it to Peter, please. Uh, thanks, Valerie. Happy to give you a bit of break and talk about uh, the treaty bodies. Um, again, if there's questions, feel free to pose them while I'm going here. Um, but as mentioned earlier by Valerie, when looking at the overall graph, the treaty bodies are the committees which derive from the core international human rights treaties. And their role, these experts uh, who are elected to be on these committees, is to monitor implementation of those treaties by the states that have ratified them. Uh, they're independent experts for fixed for renewable terms, and they're nominated by states. Uh, they have a diverse geographic and, uh, and gender balance. And they're between 10 and 25 members, and in total we have 10 of these so-called treaty bodies uh, who meet typically here in Geneva, although meetings are suspended for the next few months for obvious reasons. Uh, but they meet here in Geneva to, to do those, to conduct those reviews of state implementation. I'll go through some of the the functions of them in more detail, uh, but here you can see an overall chart of the various treaties at the top, uh, and then the committees which come from them down at the bottom. Uh, for example, you have the Convention on uh, the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is the first one, Civil and Political Rights, the second, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is the third, Discrimination Against Women, fourth, Convention Against Torture, the fifth, the Committee on the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Their Families, Convention of the Rights of People with dis Persons with Disabilities, uh, and Enforced and Voluntary Disappearances. So those are the core international human rights treaties, and for countries that have acceded to those treaties or ratified them, uh, they have agreed to be uh, reviewed on their implementation by a relevance uh, committee, a treaty body that reviews that implementation. And these review processes, uh, this is one of their functions, this review process takes place on a recurring basis. Uh, and the state will, similar to the UPR process, provide its state report indicating what it's doing to meet its obligations under the treaty. These treaties should typically be uh, enforceable by law in, in the state. And uh, they should be, the state should be taking positive steps to implement their provisions. Uh, so the state will come before the committee, share its report, uh, and the committee members will have a, a constructive dialogue with the state, um, asking questions about certain aspects, certain issues, and then ultimately issuing recommendations to the state on how it can better meet uh, its legal obligations. Uh, and in that context, uh, UNHCR has regularly, I mean, from our team's perspective, UNHCR has regularly been engaged. So we work with our operations in the field to bring through this process uh, the issues that we think are most relevant to the application of these conventions to our persons of concern. We do this as a confidential channel, so unlike the UPR where it's a public review, uh, there are a public, there is a public review phase in the treaty body process, but we also can channel and we usually provide our information confidentially. So this allows us to provide a bit more uh, concrete and, and um, serious recommendations about sensitive issues that we're, we're seeing. I mean, there's channels to do so for the UPR process as well, but in general, we, we submit all of our information through this process confidentially. Uh, and then the committees will raise these questions to states, raise these issues, and issue recommendations, 
And then states similar to the UPR are intent expected to take steps to implement them um, before the next time they come up for review. So this can be a really useful way for operations, it's clusters or UNHCR you know, operations to put on the agenda of states certain recommendations about where human rights are not being implemented for displaced persons. Um, in support of those contributions, we can also engage directly with these committees. We can provide confidential oral briefings when states are coming up for review where we know there's, uh, for example, an important uh, displacement context and certain rights under that particular convention are not being respected by a state. We can also provide thematic briefings if we see a certain area affecting internally displaced persons not being you know, adequately addressed when, this, when the committees are reviewing states. Uh, we can try and find scope there to, to see what their perspectives are and provide more information. We can also uh, engage committee members and events. Uh, these are independent members. They are typically lawyers or professors who have uh, a, a powerful voice, and we can also engage with them in, in different events that we, we think could highlight the protection issues that we're seeing in the field. Uh, we also have the opportunity to contribute to the developments of commentaries that these treaty bodies develop. Uh, these are their interpretations of how to apply the treaties, and so we want to make sure that we can include where relevant the displacement angle uh, in that development of human rights law. We want to make sure that the particular challenges that displaced persons face are reflected in that, that evolution and that, those commentaries uh, on these conventions. Uh, one other final point uh, that the treaty bodies can do and might, might be able to be a useful tool for some operations uh, is where a state has accepted uh, or acceded to an optional protocol or a relevant part of a particular convention, they may have accepted uh, what are known as individual complaints procedures. And these are procedures that allow individuals or groups of individuals to submit complaints directly to the committees, uh, typically after exhausting domestic remedies in their state, uh, highlighting a human rights violation or a potential human rights violation, and seeking the committees to issue a decision and to review their case. Uh, so in, in, this has been something that we've worked on with some of the UNHCR's operations in the field, where we've seen um, Examples that come to mind relate to refugees, but can equally apply to uh, internally displaced persons, where we've seen someone uh, at risk of deportation, and we've uh, exhausted domestic remedies in that state, and we've reached out and supported them to file complaints directly to these treaty bodies, who have then issued recommendations to the state, asked that the state not continue with the deportation until they can analyze uh, and review the case. So. That's another channel we can also use in engaging with these treaty bodies to kind of spur action by the government. I think that is, in general terms, the, the treaty body system and, and how we, we engage with it. But uh, Valerie, if you had anything else to add on that, uh, I can pass back to you and, and open the floor for questions. Yeah, maybe just to mention very briefly in one sentence, the last point that uh, about the individual complaints mechanisms. I think it's very rarely part of our referral pathways in uh, in uh, country level cluster system, and it's quite an effective remedy that we can use. But maybe we would need again another webinar to go more in depth. But this is an additional uh, avenue that we can use once we exhaust uh, the local uh, level uh, system and still the case is preoccupying from protection uh, side. Um, uh, it's not resolved and we need to uh, reach out to higher instances. So uh, I think uh, we have exhausted the very brief presentation and would be happy to do you see any further questions at this point or suggestions how to take it forward or a request for support uh, or further engagement? And uh, we would like them to also share with you, with William, some of uh, the elements that we have foreseen to come uh, next. Thanks, Valerie. Can I come in? Please. Um, William here. In light of uh, also the time, this uh, I want to really thank you for a very comprehensive uh, 
uh, presentation. And if it highlights anything, it highlights uh, how much opportunity we have that we haven't been systematically using uh, or uh, professionalizing the use of uh, as part of the cluster uh, in general. So I would be very grateful if uh, if you can also share your contacts for uh, some of the national clusters to contact you uh, uh, after afterwards, maybe to have dedicated discussions uh, country by country for those who are interested uh, on how to take it forward. Uh, I hope that would be possible and useful. Uh, the second element is uh, sometimes uh, the variety of the cluster, as uh, we all know, uh, um, uh, creates different uh, approaches to human rights between UN agencies and NGOs. And it's very important, I think, to reinforce the message that uh, uh, that sometimes the cluster has uh, to accommodate this diversity uh, and maybe use some tactics of advocacy or use of information that might go beyond the uh, uh, wishes of specific UN agencies, uh, but also lean more towards uh, what the NGOs uh, want. Uh, over back to you, uh, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. And I think this is webinar is somehow just a teaser of uh, all the opportunities of human rights mechanisms uh, in the context of protection clusters. And I have just shared my uh, email in the chat box. And what you mentioned, I fully agree. We uh, we know the specificities of production clusters and uh, that it represents a wide variety of stakeholders, but I believe this is not compromised in the interaction with the human rights mechanisms because we can submit as the civil society members, as, uh, you know, we don't need to represent under UN agencies. So it has different opportunities and we can discuss more in detail uh, the practicalities when it comes to more concrete uh, uh, questions and engagement. Um, but if you would agree, William, maybe we can briefly mention the next steps. Go ahead. Should I, should I go ahead? <laughs> yes. Go uh, ahead. Okay, thank you. Peter, can we move to the last slide, please? So maybe this should be rather announced by William. Uh, what do you think, the creation of the task team? I... Thanks, uh, thanks, Valerie. I think, I, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, uh, we have agreed under the Global Protection Cluster to establish a task team on human rights. Uh, um, and maybe, uh, Valerie, you want to mention a few, uh, uh, a few points mm -hmm. around this. Go ahead. Thank you, William. So we are pretty excited about that, but uh, excited in a measure that, again, this is only to uh, do something which you feel is useful and where you feel is the need. So I believe we will be reaching out uh, um, shortly to you to hear more about where you think uh, you could use human rights mechanisms and how we could support you. But uh, broadly speaking, we see opportunities in um, uh, the protection analysis, uh, protection monitoring, include aspects related to human rights, streamline the different reporting you are doing. Some of you are already reporting to some human rights mechanisms and bodies. So to bring it together with the protection monitoring systems, uh, secondly, to look into the uh, HCT protection strategies to also highlight links to human rights uh, and human rights violations where relevant, where feasible, where useful. And to look into the advocacy strategies and how uh, some channels uh, related to human rights mechanisms could be useful for you and uh, how to broaden the spectrum of stakeholders protection clusters engage uh, with, uh, namely the national human rights institutions and uh, eventually development actors working on human rights, very relevant, and others. So uh, this is just to give you some hints, but we will be reaching uh, on this. Uh, we are fully aware that there is a need to build more um, 
capacity on human rights engagement. Um, this is on the UNHCR side, but uh, of course this will be a resource available for production clusters as well. Uh, we are just starting to work on a blended learning program on human rights engagement in practice. So not only explaining the different mechanisms, but rather uh, looking very practically what it means for us, how we can use them in which situation it's good or what are the disadvantages, what, uh, what is faster. Uh, so uh, all those aspects to bring it in a learning program that can be used in a modular way. We have also launched a community of practice on human rights engagement and maybe we will, uh, could be look, uh, looking into how to bridge it with the GPC community of practice and make links uh, so as to ensure that we have good synergies uh, on this. We do conduct already monthly thematic webinars. We can share with you the recording of the previous ones where you would get some more detailed information on, on various topics, namely how to engage with the individual complaints mechanisms, how to follow up and look into impact of recommendations of, uh, uh, to the human rights mechanism. So if you have other suggestions for themes that would be useful for you, please don't hesitate to get in touch as well. So uh, just uh, some uh, ideas. Uh, going back to the Secretary General's call to action on human rights, which has been just recently released. Uh, it was also a question to you. It may be a quite recent document, but I'm sure some of the protection clusters are already looking what it means for them, uh, how to link their national action plans to some of the pillars. So uh, bring all this together to ensure that we see the synergies and the opportunities of the system. Again, we're relevant and we're useful for you because the bottom line, this is not additional work for you if you don't seem to, uh, if you don't find added value in the given context. This is just to reinforce the good work you are already doing. Thank you. Over to you, William. First, Big thanks to you guys to, to take such a very comprehensive and uh, complex uh, system and explain it to us in uh, 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, you have succeeded, I think, in, uh, in getting the attention of uh, many of the uh, field colleagues. Uh, I agree with you, this is but a start. Uh, we have many streams uh, to go ahead. What I suggest to Valerie is, as a follow up on this, maybe yourself and me, we can co-write uh, a small uh, letter to the coordinators as a follow up on this, uh, outlining the next steps as well as identifying how we can uh, continue following up. Uh, I thank all the colleagues uh, uh, calling from the field. Uh, I thank also uh, the Human Rights uh, un Liaison Unit uh, that we have for organizing this as well as operation cell. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, move uh, uh, this important piece of work forward with, in collaboration with all of you and, uh, uh, and try to make uh, a difference. So uh, I take this opportunity to thank you all. Stay safe uh, in uh, COVID-19 era uh, and uh, have a great evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, William and the GPC. Thank you, Bye. Valerie, William, and everyone. Bye. Thank you.